Welcome back to the Rock Your Retirement Show. I'm your host, Kathy Klein, and today's guest host is an expert on pain. Last week, my guest host and I talked about how the healthcare system treats pain. That was a very interesting conversation. Let me tell you a little about my guest host in case you haven't listened to the first and second of this series. Dr. Kevin Kukaro is a fellowship trained specialist and expert on the science of pain, trained in anesthesiology at the University of Chicago, and has a fellowship in pain medicine at the University of Michigan. He also served as an associate program director at the Naval Medical Center San Diego's Pain Medicine Fellowship Program, and he focuses on creating solutions for pain and pain-related topics important to healthcare systems, clinicians, and the public. He has a free training at whywehurt.com, and so after the show, go on over there and check it out, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes as well. In the first episode, we discussed what happened to me and how I could have prevented it as far as my pain goes. Last week, like I said, we discussed how well our health system treats pain, and today we're discussing pain myths and misconceptions. And next week, he'll give us the secret of why firefighters are better pain specialists than actual pain specialists. So if you have pain or know someone who does, then you're going to want to stick around for the last two parts of this series. And if you haven't listened to the first two parts, head on back over to the show and take a listen. But before we start, I wanted to tell you that this episode is brought to you by the Medicare Quick Step-by-Step Guide for Signing Up for Medicare. If you're signing up for Medicare, you already know how confusing it can be. So head on over to medicarequick.com slash checklist and grab your free document. Doctor, thank you so much for co-hosting. I'm thankful that you are here once again to help me and my audience with our pain. Well, thank you, Kathy, for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad. So I do know that there's a lot of misconceptions out there about pain. And we touched on them a little bit last week. One of those is that our doctor can fix us. Yeah, and we've actually been touching them through all the episodes. I hope, I hope. That's, <laughs> that's sort of like one of the goals here. But yeah, the, that's a good one, right? The idea that we can be fixed, or, or I should say, the idea that pain can be chopped out or cut or poked or drugged out of us um, is a huge misconception. And that tends to come from this idea, again, that, that pain oozes out of the body like pus. And it's easy to understand that, right? Because the way we kind of perceive things. But if we believe that if I poke you in the ni- in the leg with a knife and that that makes pain travel like a little pus from that knife cut into, into your brain, then it would make sense that we would be like, oh, well, someone must interrupt the flow of the pain pus. So maybe the doctor can block the flow of the pain pus or maybe he can chop out the pain pus where the pain pus is coming from. Or maybe we need a drug that stops the pain pus. Maybe and, we should use the word pain lava. Pain lava? <laughs> <laughs> pain plus is giving me this visual image. <laughs> well, and that's sort of what the goal is. I, like, I want people to have an image like that because okay. when we, I'm, and I'm, this is sort of a way to sort of make it kind of absurd at the same token, because this is the way that people think. And specifically, I will say, this is the way that doctors tend to think about pain. Again, I'm a fellowship trained pain specialist, so I was supposed to be the expert in pain, and this is the way that we typically described it. And the words that we would use would be things like a pain generator. So like if there was a uh, something in your back or your body or your shoulder or whatever, and that was where the quote unquote pain generator was, and it would send the pain signals up to your brain. And what we know that that's not simply true. Because any pain in any scenario, you have both nerve information coming from the body. So they're not pain signals. All they are is nerve signals. And there are many, many, many different types of nerve signals that go up to the brain. But you still have to have those brain related aspects. You have to have that cognitive element and you have to have that emotional component in order to construct an experience of pain. Hmm. And so that I would say that then the biggest misconception about pain really is the idea that pain equals damage or that pain comes from the body, unadulterated, flowing like pus, instead recognizing that pain is constructed in the brain. That's all pain, acute and chronic. It doesn't mean that when you're experiencing pain that it's not real. 
It's a hundred percent real. Uh, and it's, but it's a hundred percent needs a, an awake and alert brain in order to make it. And that's why, and I don't remember if it was last episode or the one before you talked about there's a disease or a condition where people don't have pain and they have shorter lifespans because of that. So they, they can experience pain. It's just extraordinarily difficult for them to do so. In fact, um, this is a, that's actually not really well known in the medical community, but there's, um, I have some, some papers on a woman who had what we would call neuropathic pain who had that condition as well, but it's called congenital insensitivity to pain. And what that, that, um, that genetic disorder really is though, is that there are specific types of nerves that come from the body to the brain that what I would call, and we're going to get in this in the next session, um, they're easy fuel to build a pain fire from. So they're, they're, they send, uh, easily attention grabbing sensory signals to the brain. Mm-hmm. And with that specific genetic disorder, those nerves don't work well. And so what people then do is they can touch hot stoves and they don't have a specific type of nerve information. They don't have that sharp sensation going up to their, up to their brain. There's no attention that it grabs and then there's no meaning. That's the other big thing. They never learn to construct pain in the future. Right. So they, so like we talked about with the hot stove, you touch the hot stove the first time you burn your hand, you withdraw it. It hurts for a while you're less likely to touch the hot stove in the future because pain is now protecting you by causing you to remember what happened the first time. Well, if you've never formed that memory because you never had an experience in that first moment when you touched the hot stove, then you actually, it makes it more difficult for you to have future pain because you don't have all this memory to associate new sensations with. And so now they continue to touch the hot stove. They'll you know, they drop a, a spoon in boiling water while they're making pasta. They'll grab it straight out of the boiling water. Um, they can have injuries to their body. They don't even know it because, because they don't have uh, this nerve information that makes it really easy to construct pain from. But they, again, I want to say that's not that they never have pain. It's just it makes it incredibly difficult for them to experience pain. Right. And then what about the people maybe in the military, spies, you know, if you watch these, these uh, show, these movies about people that have learned they can be tortured and they still won't give up the information. Do you think that that that's because they've been trained, they trained their brain to maybe put the pain somewhere? I mean, they're still feeling pain. Well, they're, they're feel, still feeling what a sensation. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and so we kind of touched on this in the first episode, but there's three key contributors that construct an experience of pain. You have the sensation that comes from the body. Then you have that cognition, which is like the thoughts and anticipation and appraisal of that sensation. And then you have the meaning that we give to that sensation. And so when you are in those, you know, people who have been trained in the military is a great example, uh, who have gone through something like uh, survival training and know what to do under torture, uh, they still have sensations and they still can have intense sensations. In fact, they're more than likely experiencing pain. But what they've been able to do is because they understand what is occurring and they've learned a skill set to survive in that scenario, they have more perceived control. They have less uncertainty with it. And so it's likely that they're not experiencing as much pain in those scenarios. Now, on the flip side of this, when I was in the military, I took care of quite a few people in the special forces. And when you put them in an environment uh, where they are no longer, they don't know what to expect, Mm -hmm. where they're unsure and it's new for them, a.k.a. most hospital scenarios, if they're going for surgery, those guys are as easy to experiencing pain as anybody else. Isn't that interesting? They're the ones that are not necessarily crying, but jumping out of the the chair when you're trying to put an IV in them. And and it was, so it's just remarkable that you can have somebody in one specific context and scenario, but because they understand it, they have training around it, they have certainty around it, and they have a sense of control, a perceived control in that environment. They can survive really things that are horrendous and have not a lot of pain associated with it. But you put them in a different environment where they're uncertain, they're unsure, they have no control and things that you would think, oh, my God, this guy's a Navy SEAL. Why is he jumping out of the bed because I'm trying to put an AV in him? And and now it starts making sense because those other variables, not just the sensations coming from the body, but the fears, uncertainty, the anxiety associated with it are huge drivers when it comes to their pain in that moment. Now, do you think that those guys, the trained Navy SEALs and the people who have, you know, military training to 
be able to undergo pain? Do you think that they would be good candidates for some of the pain control techniques that we've talked about in other episodes? I, I think so. Absolutely. Because, um, uh, they have some of the basic skill sets. And so all of what you're trying to do is then make them more aware of pain. So the stuff that I've been trying to explain to the audience about pain and this idea of how pain is constructed, um, is despite the fact that we have 20, 30 years of research on, is not widely disseminated uh, in the medical community, which makes it even less, less out there for the public. And so a lot of people are learning skills, but they're not understanding why those skills work. And they still have a kind of an old model of thinking that pain equals damage or it's, all, it's either pain equals damage or it's being made up in my head, not pain. All pain is constructed in the head. Um, so just having a little bit of more awareness of what pain is, my suspicion is they would be able to take the same skill sets that they have learned and applied and say, you know, that horrible torture scenario that you said but they would probably be able to apply those same skill sets into a different scenario. Maybe they're not in the military anymore, but they can use those skill sets if they are having pain in the, you know, in a safer environment, as long as they can understand it, they can apply the tools. Wow. That's that, you know, I never thought of it that way. So I'm really glad that, that I had you come on the show to, you know, talk about this because when you think about it, we, we Americans in particular, are taught to take a pill. It's like, oh, something's wrong with you, take a pill. And we talked about this in a previous episode about the advertising that's going. You know, I I was in England for three weeks and it was really nice not having to watch those those commercials every yes. three minutes. You know, and I I don't have regular public TV. You know, my husband and I gave up um, cable several years ago and now I watch Hulu. And so the the commercials, I mean, there's not as many of them, but it's the same commercial over and over again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever watched uh, Hulu or. Yeah, I, I understand what you're talking about. And every time I'm like, well, why in the world would you say, play the same commercial for four times in this one episode? I know because they want you to, they, they want to make sure that it's embedded in your brain. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was very refreshing not having to, you know, watch those. And also, I don't know if we talked about this, but I got sick when I was in England and that's why the listeners probably noticed that my voice doesn't sound like it normally does. I got sick in August and we are recording this mid to to late September and my voice still has not recovered. And um, when I went there, you know, I, I don't like to take medications. I, I just never have. And they seem to affect me. And, and so I got, I got sick with, I think it was probably bronchitis. They didn't tell me what it was, but about two days before I, two, three days before I was to go home and we were there for almost three weeks. I said, well, I better go to the doctor because this is not getting better. And I didn't want the plane to tell me I couldn't get on. <laughs> and so I went to the doctor and have you ever, have you ever been to the English medical system? No, no. I, I try to stay out of any medical system. Yeah, it's probably smart. So I went and we found a clinic. It's, it's hard when you're in another country and you don't really know what you're doing. And, you know, we weren't staying in a hotel. So it wasn't like we could go to the concierge. Yeah. And so I found a clinic and we drove down there right after they opened. And the first thing that they did was triage. So I checked in and they said, go wait over there and they'll call you. And so they called me within five minutes and I went in there. They took my temperature, took my blood pressure and asked me some questions. And then they said, okay, go back out there and we'll call you. And I didn't know this at the time, but basically they were screening me to see if I needed to see the doctor. And because my husband did the same thing and they said to him, we don't think that you need to see the doctor, but if you'd like to see the doctor, you can wait. And with me, they said, we'll get the doctor for you. So apparently I had a temperature or whatever it was. And I saw the doctor and he gave me uh, ampicillin, I guess. Now, I was, 
a little itchy. I, I don't think I'd ever taken penicillin before. And so my wrists got a little itchy, but I was fine. I wouldn't say I'm allergic to it. But the experience in England was so much different than the experience had I gone to the urgent care here in America, I probably would have been there five or six hours. And that's my experience whenever I've gone to an urgent care. The, the visit was free. Even though, you know, I said, you know, I don't live here. You know, do I have to pay anything? And they said, no, no, this is a free visit. And then the medication was $8, 8 or $9. And um, that was my experience in England. And, you know, I am not, I'm not somebody that would say that I'm pro-universal health care because I'm not. But, and, and I'm not 100% sure that if we implemented universal health care here. It would look like it looks in England. Uh, I'm just not as, um, I, I don't trust the government, our government to run something to look that smooth, just from what I've seen at the DMV and the, <laughs> and the, uh, you know, other place, you know, like the, what do you call it? The post office. But I can tell you that I was very impressed. Now, one of the things that I thought is that they over there, they control the drug companies. The drug companies don't control them. And, you know, one, one thing pointing towards that is they don't let them advertise. The government basically buys the drugs. And so the drug costs are lower. Now, whether I feel that all drug companies should be controlled by a government, I don't know, because it's my opinion. I don't know if this is backed by fact, but it's my opinion that a lot of the drugs, the drugs that save people come from this country. And so I don't know how I feel about restricting profit to drug companies. So I know this is kind of bringing something else up into this conversation, but it does relate to, to pain because some of these pain drugs right now, uh, first of all, are, are probably stronger than, than people need. But on the other hand, Right now, there's a edict with Medicare where people can only get seven days of opioids. And if you're in severe pain and you haven't learned these techniques that you have, that's putting a lot of restrictions on our older population. What do you think? Oh, you have so much there that to comment on. <laughs> <laughs> we have time. We, we started it initially with the pharmaceutical ads. The start of that was you were in England and you didn't see the pharmaceutical ads. And um, so I'm going to return there really quick because, again, this idea, I think we talked about this in the last episode, but um, our bodies are remarkably resilient. Our brains and bodies are, are remarkable self healer. And unless you are being told otherwise. And so direct to consumer advertising from pharmaceutical companies wasn't allowed in the United States until 1998. And so I like to think about what, what were the commercials? And I, just like you, I don't watch a lot of TV, but if we're traveling and there's a hotel and I'll turn on the, on the, on the TV there, I'm always astounded at what the, what the commercials are now. When I was little, out of 10 commercials, the, the most of them were breakfast cereal, some were toys, and then there were some of the local ads about a car dealership. But if you turn on the TV now, it's about seven out of 10 of those ads that you're seeing on the TV are pharma ads. Mm. Um, and they're just usually describing a drug that's for a quote chronic condition, some of which they make up, by the way. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> and it is, and that's a little bit sh shocking. Um, but they'll make up these conditions, and um, and so they you're you're really training people to believe that you're sick all the time and there's nothing that you can do. But take a pill. But take a pill, and you need to take a pill. So that's that's on the pharmaceutical ads. God, you had so much in there. There's so much things I can comment on. Um, but, but you ended on the Medicare and the prescriptions, and particularly with opioids and the seven-day limit. Well, the reason the seven-day limit was it was picked with acute prescribing was not had nothing to do with pain. In fact, I my 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 personal experience again. This is what I do. I work with healthcare systems. I work with clinicians to teach them about pain. And most healthcare systems are pretty pain illiterate. But the reason that seven-day window was picked was because if you look at how acute um, the timeline for a, a, what we would call an acute opioid prescription, so somebody who's never been on an opioid before taking an opioid, 
after three days, we start seeing increased risk of long-term dependency or what we, people refer to this addiction, but people becoming dependent on this medication. And right. those risks tend to escalate even higher after seven days. So the reason that number was picked was not because of pain per se, but because of risk reduction strategies. For addiction. For, for addiction and long-term harm. Now, from a pain standpoint, things get a little bit more uh, interesting because, again, most people have this what we call really linear or one to one thing with pain that pain equals physical damage. When I'm having an acute pain in this moment, it means there's, there's there's physical harm to me. Well, again, if you break your leg in this moment in time or you're stabbed with a knife, you still have all these other components. You have both the sensory information coming from the body, but you still have those brain related areas, the cognition and the emotion that are there as well. Now, those sensory elements coming from the body tend to, if you have an acute injury, are worse in the first 24 to 48 hours, and then they start to get better. And so what I mean by that is even if you've had a surgery, after about the first two days, those sensory information coming from the body die down, and it starts to move up into the spinal cord into the brain itself. Oh. And we, we know is at that point, um, some of the medications that are designed to, to kind of target those peripheral nerve information are now less effective. And opioids work on multiple different areas in both the brain and the body, but the place where they seem to be the safest and have most effect for are when people have a lot of that peripheral information, which is most present in the first one to two days after an acute injury, say you broke your leg or had surgery. After that first 48 hours, unless you have like someone who's got burns or something like that, um, those, those, that cellular activity is much less. And so um, that's basically a long way to say is the risks go up after seven days and the, um, the actual pharmacologic effect from the drug itself, uh, the inherent activity of the drug is actually less effective after about three to five days. And so it doesn't make sense. And then to keep progressing it now, can people still hurt? Oh, absolutely. Here's the issue, doctor. The issue is people who have been on long-term pain reduction using medications, and then Medicare says you can only have seven days, but they don't give them alternatives. They don't say, but we're going to train you to deal with your pain, but we're going to you know, give you biofeedback, or we're going to help you learn how to meditate, or we're going to give, put you on an exercise program that will help. All they did was take away the drug. It, well, you're, you're, and we're talking two different things, though, because we're talking acute prescribing guidelines. Mm -hmm. So this is what we would call for, quote unquote, new scenarios is where that seven day guideline came in. Mm, well, yeah, for a long term, they're still not recommended, but they're trying to introduce, you know, something else <laughs> as, as, as a long term. Right? Now, for me, this makes a big difference if you are a physician or a prescriber. Okay. Because those guidelines are written with the idea that there's somehow only acute pain, i.e. physical pain. And then there's chronic pain, which is something else. And we're, we'll just call it, maybe it's in your brain and that's all it is. And so that they, they've made these guidelines for the acute prescribing with the idea that somehow acute pain is fundamentally different than chronic pain. <laughs> right. Now, the problem with this is if you have someone who has what we would call a lot of these hypervigilant state, have a lot of, of, of uh, their brains see a lot of threat, threat perception in, the, in, their, in, in their brains because of past trauma, anxiety, depression, all this other stuff. And then they break their leg. How we talk, discuss, and treat that individual should be different than talking to somebody who has none of those risk factors involved and how we, you know, the follow-up and the prescribing and everything else had changed. And it's not because the, the, the quote, it's not a timing anymore, but it's who is sitting in front of you that becomes much more important to look at. Hmm. There's a whole bunch more there, but I don't, we, we don't have a lot more time. So I know we don't have time. I wish we could talk all day. So how can my listener find you if they want to learn more? 
So again, the, the easiest way is just go to whywehurt.com. And um, that just gives you a, there's a little free class there on an introduction to pain and pain science. And that would be the easiest step for them because I, I bet they're less interested in me and more interested in learning about pain. <laughs> and I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Thanks again for coming on the uh, show today. And I can't wait till next week where we learn about why firefighters are better pain specialists than actual pain specialists. Thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. And for the listener, we'll see you next time on Rock Your Retirement. Bye.